Hello and welcome everyone today to today's webinar. Thank you all for joining. If you joined our last webinar in the summer, then you know we've been focused on Canadians' healthcare experiences during COVID-19. We're going to continue on that theme um, with today's focus being um, Canadians' experiences this year. So go to the next slide. We've got a very, um, only two presentations, but I think it's going to be very interesting. I'm hoping we can all take a lot from it. I've got a little bit of um, just a few notes on welcoming and introductions, and then we'll jump right into the presentation. So if you go to the next slide. My name is Sikirtha Tharmalingam. I'm the Manager of Valuation Methods here at Canada Health InfoWay, and I'm very happy um, for my role in convening this group and continuing to host these webinars and hearing from all the uh, various different digital health evaluations um, and experiences that we hear from. Uh, in terms of uh, housekeeping, we will be using the Q&A feature uh, on Zoom throughout the presentation. So if you've got questions, feel free to submit it through there. Um, the Q&A will happen at the end though. And if you're joining today's webinar, if this is your first time joining one of our webinar series, I want to welcome you and also invite you to get on our mailing list if you're interested in attending future webinars such as this one. Uh, we're constantly evolving and bringing together uh, jurisdictional leaders, evaluators, researchers to share best practices and learn from each other really in the digital health evaluation space as, as this space continues to evolve. And I also encourage you to visit our research and benefit evaluation uh, web page for updates and also uh, a recording of today's webinar will also be posted there. And so now we will go to the next slide. We'll just jump right into our first presentation. Today we've got Ellie Yu. She's a senior analyst with Canada Health InfoWay to kick things off. And Ellie talked to us at last at our last webinar as well about digital health literacy. But today she's going to talk to us about um, really some very exciting results uh, from our survey of Canadians, over 12,000 Canadians exploring the experience, utilization, and expectations regarding digital health services in Canada. So I'm going to turn it over to Ellie, and uh, I'll catch you all back when we uh, move on to the next pre presenter. Thank you, Sukursa, for the introduction. Welcome, and thank you for joining this webinar. Uh, today, I, as Sakurtha said, I'll be diving into the findings from the newest Canadian Digital Health Survey conducted in partnership with Leger. Now, before I start my presentation, I would like to first uh, start off with a land acknowledgement to say that we acknowledge that the land on which we are hosting this meeting include the traditional territories of many nations. Canada Health InfoWay recognizes that the many injustices experienced by the Indigenous peoples of what we now call Canada continue to affect their health and well-being. Canada Health InfoWay respects that Indigenous peoples have rich culture and traditional practices that have been known to improve health outcomes. I invite all attendees to reflect on the territories you are now calling in from as we commit ourselves to gaining knowledge, forging a new culturally safe relationship and contributing to reconciliation. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. I'll first go through uh, study objectives the Canadian Digital Health Survey is an annual survey that InfoWay commissions with the purpose of updating our understanding of Canadians utilization and experience with digital health technologies. This year, we have placed a greater focus on understanding the use and perceptions of virtual care services among Canadians 16 and over. Next slide, please. Now the survey itself is an online survey, and this year we have managed to reach over 12,000 Canadians with representative sample across all the provinces and territories. Next slide, please. Data collection was conducted between July 14th to August 6th of 2021. Throughout the report, we will be pointing out significant differences comparing different demographic groups as well as comparing this year's data to previous year's data. The green and red texts 
indicate significant differences, as you will see throughout the presentation. Next slide, please. And then next slide. Right. Thank you. Now, looking at the demand for and use of digital health services, which includes services such as e-view of information, e-booking, and remote patient monitoring programs, as well as virtual visits and more, we can see that the demand is high among Canadians. Now, Canadians are expressing demand for digital health services, with over 80% want to do e-prescribing, 8 in 10 wants to access their personal health information electronically, and around three-fourths of Canadians wants to book appointments electronically. Now, demand for virtual visits are also pretty high, with 69% wanting to visit their healthcare provider via the telephone, 56% wanting video visits, and 57% wanting secure messaging. Now, this level of consumer demand signals a shift of preferences for more digital and more virtual options, Canadians want to have more options on how they can manage their care, access their information, and how they engage with their healthcare provider and the broader health system. However, we know that demand doesn't always translate to use. And from this graph, we can also see that there are significant gaps between demand and use for a majority of the digital health services we surveyed. Although some gaps are closing due to public health guidelines and social distancing measures, for example, telephone visits and COVID vaccine booking. But generally speaking, the gap between demand and use remains. Next slide, please. Now this slide focuses on what we call unmet demand, which is the gap between demand and use. Consumers have expressed strong but uh, strong demand, but access and use have to play catch up. We can see that for services such as access to clinical notes, electronic access to specialist referral, prescription e-renewal and e-booking of appointments, unmet demand is over 50%. Meaning that of all the Canadians surveyed, over 50% of the expressed demand for this service did not translate to usage. Now, there are various factors that contribute to low levels of use. Limited access to technological equipment and internet can hinder usage. Inadequate digital and digital health literacy also could prevent consumers from using certain types of services. Unfriendly user interface and difficulties associated with setting up a user ID and logins could further prevent use. There are also health system barriers, such as lack of interoperability and difficulties with transferring patient summaries between silos that needs to be addressed. Next slide, please. Now looking specifically at demand for virtual visits, since 2020, we have seen increased demand for telephone visit, video visit, as well as secure messaging. Even though social distancing rules has been relaxed for healthcare interactions, consumers remain interested in accessing virtual visit as an option. Looking at the breakdown by age group, interest is high among the 25 to 54 age group, which represents a large portion of the working population. Now this group could potentially benefit most from alternative options of care, especially when in-person care is inconvenient or may result in additional costs from traveling and dependent care arrangements. InfoWay's analysis has shown that cost savings from travel could be significant. In 2020 alone, the total money savings in relation to using virtual care amounts to around 65 million, if 4% of all primary care visits were conducted virtually. Surprisingly, demand for video visit is lower among those between the age of 16 to 24. Now we would expect this virtual generation to expre express higher preference for virtual visits. However, there might be some barriers that this age group faces that needs to be addressed. Preferences of younger Canadians in Canada has not really been thoroughly studied and this could definitely be an interesting topic to look into. Now, next slide, please. Compared to 2020, the proportion of respondents who have used video visits have increased from 14 to 
Use of secure messaging has remained the same and use of telephone visits have slightly decreased to 45%. The increased usage in video could be explained by the expansion of private virtual care vendors providing services mainly through video consultations. Now the bulk of publicly funded services were provided through either video or audio formats. However, as in-person visits resumed, some of the telephone visits could have been transferred to in-person modalities. With a few exceptions, secure messaging has not been included in the temporary fee code set up by jurisdictions, and hence we did not observe usage growth via this modality. Overall, 51% of Canadians have used either video, telephone, or secure messaging ever in the past. Looking at the age breakdowns, the use of video and secure messaging was lower among older adults. Now, this is consistent with some research suggesting that the use of video and secure messaging among older adults is hindered by barriers such as low digital health literacy, lack of proper equipment, and physical and sensory disabilities that are more common among this age group. Looking across different jurisdictions, respondents from Atlantic Canada and BC shows higher usage. Now, variations in billing and recommended practice among provinces and territories could partially explain some of these variations in the usage that we observe. In addition, more females reported use when compared to males, gender differences in the utilization of healthcare services is well established to show that female uses more healthcare services than males. Next slide, please. And then we're gonna look at virtual care visits. Thank you. Now compared to 2020, Fewer most recent virtual visits were COVID-19 related. The distribution of modality of these visits remains about the same with around eight in 10 conducted over the telephone, less than 20% conducted over video and very little conducted via secure messaging. We did observe a growth in the market share for Zoom, now making up just under 30% of all virtual visits conducted, excluding the telephone use. The expansion of Zoom was anticipated as a couple of provinces and territories were providing virtual visits through Zoom, and InfoWay has facilitated some of these projects through our rapid response program. Next slide, please. Also consistent with what we have been seeing over the pandemic, the majority of virtual visits was conducted with a family doctor, followed by specialists, and then GPs at walk-in clinics. Comparing the modalities these providers used, we can see that most providers conducted the majority of their virtual visits via the telephone. Now, with the exception of mental health care providers, around 61% of all virtual visits with a mental health care provider was conducted over video. Now, this points to some interesting consumer or provider preferences when it comes to service provision for mental health. This could also provide some evidence for the conversation on appropriateness of virtual visits and how it could be used post-pandemic to supplement in-person care. Around three-fourths of the most recent virtual visit was covered by a government health plans. Just over one in 10 was covered by insurance plan, and there was a decrease in the proportion of out-of-pocket payments um, as ex employee programs via insurance coverage increased. The distribution of payment coverage for two visit modalities, phone and video, are shown here. Now, what we see here is that a larger portion of phone visits were covered by government plans in comparison to video visits and a larger portion of video visits were covered by insurance and out-of-pocket payments. This could potentially point to some inequities in access where, the, where those with insurance have better and more access to video visits provided by private vendors. Next slide, please. Now, consumer perception of virtual visit appears to be largely positive. 9 in 10 report that they were satisfied overall, 8 in 10 avoided an in-person visit, and 9 in 10 reported that the virtual visit saved them time and money. Notably, the concerns around losing the personal touch with your healthcare provider was not really observed in our findings. 
around eight in 10 Canadian surveys said that they felt involved in decision making around their healthcare. And seven in 10 said the personal connection with healthcare provider was the same as an in-person visit. Now, of course, we acknowledge that not everyone experienced virtual visits the same way. Investigations into how different populations perceive different modalities of virtual visits with different kinds of care providers will provide a more nuanced understanding of Canadians' experiences with virtual care. Next slide, please. Now, the top reason for choosing virtual over in-person for the most recent virtual visit is because virtual was the only option offered by the healthcare provider, followed by some consumer side financial and time benefits, and then recommendations from a healthcare provider. From the top three reasons chosen, we can see that the choice of virtual visit modality is largely provider driven. Now, we also asked respondents their reasons for choosing virtual over in-person for future visits. Around 60% of consumers said convenience is one of their top three reasons for choosing virtual, followed by shorter wait times and cost savings. We can see that convenience, cost, and time savings are what consumers consider as important drivers for virtual care use. There is a portion, about 17% of Canadians who are resistant to virtual visit. Um, they tend to be older individuals and individuals with lower digital health literacy. It's important to understand the perception and needs of this population to ensure that they have access to information about virtual care and are given equal opportunities to make informed decisions around their visit options. Next slide, please. Now, consumers view prescription renewal, checkups for minor healthcare problems, and follow up appointments for a health problem, appropriate uses for virtual visits. Meanwhile, consumers prefer to appear in person for appointments such as annual exams, routine exams, screening, mental health, and contraception counseling. Next slide, please. A common theme around observed variation in demand use and preference for virtual visit is related to an individual's digital health literacy. Especially with COVID and the rapid expansion of virtual care, it is more critical that we understand how digital health literacy impacts health behaviors. And we have been tracking Canadians' digital health literacy since 2020 to see if the COVID pandemic had any impact Specifically, we used the eHealth tool to measure digital health literacy. The tool was designed to assess consumers' perceived skills at using information technology for health and to aid in determining the fit between eHealth programs and consumers. Now, we did not observe changes to the national average eHealth score since 2020. We did find significant associations between digital health literacy and socioeconomic factors such as age, education, income, community size, and access and use of digital health services. Next slide, please. Now, I just want to end my presentation with some key takeaways. First, Canadians want digital health services, with the majority of Canadians surveyed expressed interest in accessing a variety of digitally enabled services. However, unmet demand for some services remains large. Second, the pandemic has shifted what healthcare looks like. With social distancing measures and halt to in-person care, we saw rapid expansions of virtual care, which continues to exist even as in-person care resumed. Although healthcare encounters with a healthcare provider are still predominantly being conducted in person, over half of Canadians now have had an experience of virtual visit and the use of video visit continues to increase. Overall, Canadians surveyed report demand for virtual care, but also signal that in-person care cannot be replaced by virtual means. Thirdly, the next step is for policymakers to find the right balance between virtual and in-person care. Overall, Canadians reported positive experiences with their virtual encounters and welcome it as part of their routine healthcare. But 
there are some Canadians still hesitant and unsure about virtual care. It's important that the rapid expansion of virtual care does not leave some Canadians behind, widening the digital divide. And finally, health equity concern needs to be addressed. For instance, Digital health literacy is an important aspect of health equity, especially for marginalized and vulnerable populations. More research needs to be done to ensure those with less digital health literacy are given the opportunity to make informed decisions on how they choose to engage with their healthcare provider, whether it be virtual or in person. And I would like to end my presentation there. Thank you all for listening, and I look forward to some questions after our next speaker. All right, thank you, Ellie. Uh, that was a super, you did a great job of unpacking a lot of findings. Um, I'm very much looking forward to the Q&A portion. And if anyone's got questions on the material that Ellie presented, do uh, feel free to type it into the Q&A box and we'll get to it at the end. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. Um, so what um, Ellie, the, maybe I'll just put a plug in here for some of the additional analysis that's been uh, done on this data you can find on our website. And we've got a slide at the end on the various different uh, place, uh, places that you can connect with us to get uh, access to more of our research and benefits evaluation activities. So next slide, please. We'll now turn it over to the Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction. We've got, uh, maybe next slide, we've got Anna Goodman, who's a research and policy analyst, as well as Sue Craig, who's a knowledge broker um, at the Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction. I'm very excited about this piece of research that they're going to talk to us about. I've had the uh, the pleasure of collaborating with them on some aspects of this research. And I think they're very um, important findings and a compliment to, we just had a, a Canadian sort of uh, view of healthcare experiences. Now we're gonna hone into some specific population and experiences. So we'll turn it over to Anna and Sue. Great, thank you, Sakurtha. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for having us. Uh, we're really excited to be able to, to share some of this research today. So uh, as it was mentioned, this is going to dovetail very nicely off of what Ellie just presented. So we are going to be covering off some data that was collected this past year, both for clients, so people accessing services and for practitioners delivering virtual services. So we kind of have both to present. And it's going to cover off some very similar sort of topics and areas that we we've been speaking about today but the difference is this data is specific only to virtual care for substance use substance use disorder and concurrent disorders which is both substance use disorder and, and mental illness so this is a very kind of honed in specific area of care that we really wanted to pick up on during the pandemic and I should mention, uh, there's three very um, lovely partners on this work, including Canada Health Infoway, um, the Royal Ottawa Mental Health Centre, and the Canadian Psychological Association. So you can go to the next slide. So it's just quickly what we're going to be going over. So yes, for those of you, you, you can go to the next slide. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the Canadian Center on Substance Use and Addiction, we are the only national organization with a legislative mandate to reduce harms related to substance use. And we do that through a number of different ways. Um, we, we very much rely on our partnerships and convening all the very different areas that touch on substance use. So everywhere from healthcare to government, to policymakers, enforcement, uh, living and lived experience. Um, we kind of work our, our best to bring everyone to the table and start to kind of collect that national picture of, of what's happening in the substance use world across the country. So if you want to find out more about us, please feel free to go to ccsa.ca. Next slide. You can go to the, the next slide. I covered that already. You can go ahead. Okay. So so kind of briefly, the, the whole sort of background and, and the reason that we did this work. So 
at the beginning of the pandemic back in 2020, seems quite long ago now, um, it was becoming very apparent that we were going to have sort of a really big gap in, in data in terms of service delivery for people who are using substances, people with substance use disorder and concurrent disorders. And this was really concerning because we had that very rapid shift to, to virtual services. Um, obviously, health sectors began to shut down. And we needed to make sure that people accessing this care were still getting the care that they needed to address their concerns and their issues, and that there weren't particular groups being left behind. So um, we did a lot of sort of pre-consultations with, with different partners and, and lived in living experience. And there was there were some issues that were brought to our attention. So uh, first it was that there was a decrease in service availability at, at that time because of uh, the public health restrictions. There was an increase in, in people uh, relapsing to substance use. And then there was um, these key groups that were not necessarily being picked up by virtual care. So maybe those that don't have access to computers, don't have access to internet, people who aren't comfortable with this technology, you know, going back to the sort of digital literacy discussion that Ellie already touched on. Um, this was really concerning for us because we didn't wanna lose this, this group in terms of their care. So we decided to do sort of a, a mixed methods approach. We wanted to do um, a survey and we really wanted to talk to people that were actually using virtual care for substance use and concurrent disorders. But um, we really also wanted to talk to the people that weren't able to use this care. And this sort of put us in a bit of a, a catch 22 because we had to do the, the data collection virtually, but we really wanted to find out about the people that don't have access to virtual care. So we thought, kind of a way to get around this was to actually do some key informant interviews with the practitioners delivering this care. So those people that are actually working with these populations and hear from them exactly what's been going on. So our objective really was just to understand the experiences and perceptions of those accessing virtual services and supports. So when we define virtual services and supports, it's uh, any sort of technology. So phone, um, video, internet, apps, where you can access education, treatment, counseling. We, we really want to keep it really broad and sort of any sort of need that someone had in, in relation to substance use and concurrent disorders, and then ensure that we aren't, um, ensure that we can find ways of reducing barriers and improving delivery of services. You can go to the next slide. So we did a, a put together an advisory committee for this. So um, virtual care is sort of a new area at CCSA. You know, it's been gaining popularity for quite some time, but we wanted to make sure we had experts uh, that could give us information on virtual care. We had other substance use experts as well, health delivery experts and, and living and lived experience and, and mental health experts as well. So as I mentioned, we did go for the mixed methods approach. So we did a national online survey and that was also with Leger, uh, of those using virtual care for substance use, substance use disorders and concurrent disorders. And then we included a, the general population in there as well. So not just people accessing the services, but we also wanted to find out just, is this something that there's appetite for in Canada? Because we have heard that we might be scaling up virtual care. You know, we're seeing numbers now that both um, mental illness and substance use has increased due to the pandemic. So if this is a really viable option, we need to make sure that Canadians would be comfortable with using virtual care for these reasons. So we also polled just the general population and then the qualitative interviews with practitioners delivering this care. And there's uh, the specific definition of virtual care that I had provided earlier. So you can go to the next slide. So I'll pass it over to Sue now and she's gonna provide the uh, quantitative results first and then I'll provide the qualitative. Okay, thanks. We can go to the next slide. Thank you. So we um, we surveyed um, about um, a thousand Canadians. The, the ones we're calling general public are the ones who were not at the time using any kind of uh, virtual care for substance use, substance use disorder or concurrent disorders. Um, and we had 326 people who were using it in some capacity. We had a relatively even breakdown between people who identify as men or as women, um, reasonable cross section of ages. We, our breakdown is not as fine as the uh, one you saw in the last survey because of our sample size and reasonable distribution across the provinces. 
We did ask about race. We did ask a fairly detailed question, but um, the numbers were far too low to really um, uh, analyze. So we won't be talking about that data on the um, in our discussions because you can see that the majority of people identified as white and then lumping everyone else in together as not as anything else is um, isn't um, isn't fair to be lumping everyone together and treating them as one group. So we did not do that analysis. Next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, we'll talk first about those 326 people who uh, were using virtual care for these types of conditions. Um, two thirds were satisfied and three quarters agreed that it saved them time and prevented the spread of COVID-19. So probably not too surprising there. Um, in terms of looking at gender, um, those who identified were women of, as women were more likely to be less satisfied with virtual care than those who identified as men, whereas uh, men were less concerned about um, having um, services delivered in person. The, um, we asked a question about, uh, we gave a list, a bit of a shopping list of what kinds of care you would like to have after the pandemic with, or after the restrictions were lifted and in person was identified by you know, not quite half of the people. Telephone continued to be um, an option identified by about a third of the people. And because that was um, several, uh, you know, several types of uh, responses that they could choose and that was pick as many as you like. Um, we, um, you know, the, the, the numbers as we analyzed them didn't add up to 100, but far more, but in person was still the most popular of those. Also, uh, men were more likely than those who identify as women to see a lack of cell phone minutes as a barrier. So women maybe had more minutes, we're not sure. And we'll, we'll look at that in the context of what InfoWay found because uh, there was certainly some, some tie in there. Next slide, please. So again, of those who are using, um, biggest barrier was cost at almost, uh, almost four in 10. Um, no, that, that ties in very well with what we just saw in the last presentation. A lack of a private space. So somewhere quiet uh, where you could actually have that sort of care um, either by video or by phone or by app. And um, the ability to, relate, to build a relationship. There were concerns about whether or not one could build a relationship um, with their care provider over virtual means. And if we look at this by age, um, those in that center middle age group were the most likely to lack privacy. So they may be people who have children at home, um, uh, elder uh, parents there or partners at home. And so less, less likely to have that privacy or that quiet space. And those who were in the oldest age group were less likely to think that they could build that relationship by virtual means, uh, having a longer lifetime of building it in person. Um, and um, the majority of them agreed that, that investing in virtual services should be a government priority. So certainly a lot of Canadians support the need for this. Next slide, please. So when we look at what we're calling the general public, which is those who are not currently using uh, virtual services and supports for these conditions, um, uh, very similar to what we saw in the last presentation, almost three quarters were, would be comfortable meeting a doctor or a nurse or, or to attend individual appointments uh, on, in a virtual way. Less comfortable with group services like AA, so those group sharing meetings. Um, only about a third though saw virtual services as effective as in-person and that's lower than those who are actually using it. So that's an interesting discrepancy. And cost again was a uh, barrier building the difficulty building relationship with the hair healthcare provider was also seen as, as a potential barrier. Next slide, please. So um, when we looked at that, um, uh, having a safe or quiet space uh, by age, we saw that uh, younger respondents were more concerned about that. Uh, they were, you know, they're probably the ones who are most likely to have parents in their home um, and, and so lack that space. They um, believe that government, uh, the same as the other group, those who are using it, there was the same level of support for believing that the government should invest in virtual services. And then we asked these people how, 
if they thought they might use virtual care for substance use or concurrent disorders in the future. And one third of them thought that they may well do that. So that's actually quite surprising thinking that that's coming for a specific condi condition um, around using virtual support. So that's actually pretty strong. Also, um, women were more likely to see traveling as a barrier among this group. And um, the, uh, the youngest people were less likely to agree that virtual care is comparable to in-person and found that office hours also uh, were going to be more of a constraint for those, those in the 18 to 24 group. Next slide, please. So that's it, back to Anna. Great, thank you, Sue. Um, so we're gonna be switching over to the key informant interviews. So the, the discussions with the practitioners. So in terms of our sample size, we were really hoping to get about uh, 30 practitioners to speak with, but given the um, constraints and the uh, huge workload that was being placed on, on healthcare providers during this time frame, uh, we, we ended with, with 14, which we were still very happy with. So this included counselors, psychologists, social workers, educators, and harm reduction providers. And again, this was all people working in the field of, of substance use and concurrent disorders. So, oh, sorry, can you go back? So almost all the services provided by the, the practitioners were given in person before the pandemic. And um, they obviously had some use of telephone with their clients and, and some had even mentioned using video in some cases, but uh, most of them were really only comfortable with, with those sort of in-person delivery methods. And none of them really had a virtual plan in place when the um, pandemic actually hit. So it was, it was a bit of a scramble for them and they had to very quickly move their services online uh, or onto the phone. Some of them mentioned that uh, they had to kind of amend those confidentiality agreements. So all the, all the paperwork you, you do with your clients before giving care, a lot of that had to change to make it possible to deliver care over the internet or over the phone. And, and some of the practitioners also commented on actually continuing to go into the office. So going back to the issue we mentioned at the beginning where there was a concern that a lot of clients were gonna drop off if the care switched to virtual, the practitioners acknowledged this and they were very concerned that some of their clients wouldn't receive any care. So they actually continued going into the office through the thick of the pandemic, which I think was um, really something to commend because you know, they were, they were concerned that clients weren't gonna get the care that they needed. You can go to the next slide. So both the clients and practitioners had uh, a, a learning curve in terms of the technology. So you can kind of imagine everything we've all gone through in, in terms of getting our home offices set up and getting our, our children onto their schooling and all these different things. Um, so that happened for the practitioners. And then they also, in some cases, had to help onboard their clients to virtual care. So they were there were some cases where they helped them get access to technology and, and things like that, or sort of helped them learn how to use the technology. So uh, that, that took up a lot of time, but it was kind of something that was resolved in the first wave of the pandemic. And I would imagine now it's probably a little more settled down. So all the practitioners agreed that this was a really great change for the folks who already had computers, who know how to use a computer and a phone, who have data on their phone. Um, you know, it's great, it's convenient. It's something that um, allowed sort of an, an actually increase in service delivery because we have more time on our hands to, to work our these types of appointments into our schedules. Um, but Conversely, on the other end, it was very detrimental for those that leave out. So it's it's leaving out those folks without um, technology or, or digital literacy. So yes, some of the benefits again, creating with a greater number of sorry, connecting with a, a greater number of people. Uh, you think about you know centers like Winnipeg or other metro areas. Um, there's a lot of rural areas where people traditionally had to drive into the city center to to talk to a doctor. That could take the whole day. Um, if if these folks have the right internet access, they can now access their tech, their care from their home. So that kind of increased the um, the number of people being reached. Flexibility um, was one as well. And then something that I thought was interesting was uh, the fact that practitioners can actually see into the homes. So uh, a lot of people were nervous that you would lose that 
one-to-one connection that you get in person. Uh, Something that the practitioners actually liked was having the ability to see the actual external environment of their clients if they're video chatting. You can see if the home is being cared for, if the client is is caring for themselves. And that's just another uh, piece of information to help them deliver the care to these clients. And then drawbacks, again, we've we've talked about this, the access to internet and technology is not equitable across the country. Not everyone has the same access to these things. And there were some accountability issues that the practitioners noted. Um, So for example, some clients would, would not necessarily show up to virtual appointments and they felt that if it had been an in-person appointment, the client probably would have came because of the accountability, but it's a little bit easier maybe to not join in when it's just from your home. Um, Some people would turn their cameras off. Uh, Some people reported there was people using substances during the virtual visits. And um, there was a bit of concern around the practitioner not having as much sort of control over the the client's behavior if they're not with them in, in person in the same room. And then finally, kind of similarly to what we saw in our quantitative data, uh, virtual care cannot replace in-person care. And that's sort of a theme that came up a lot. So we can go to the next slide. Okay, um, so just quickly, we, we kind of come, came up with some key implications of, of both the quantitative and qualitative data. So uh, as we saw in the, in the statistics there, both the general public and sort of the people receiving the care, although not to the same extent, aren't super trusting of the effectiveness of virtual care. They, they're they concerned they're not going to get the same um, effectiveness of care that they would in person. And we know that isn't necessarily true. There's a lot of evidence and research showing that you can deliver effective care that would uh, actually result in, in behavior change uh, virtually. So it'd be important to kind of create awareness around um, this for, for the public. And uh, increasing the comfort with technologies and goes into the digital digital literacy piece as well. How do we make sure that both our clients and our practitioners are comfortable with technology and know how to use it and have sort of the technical, technical support that they need? Um, in terms of demographics, you know, geography, age, gender, we saw some really interesting results around that. So I think it's really key moving forward to ensure that practitioners and people delivering health services have flexibility in tailoring their service options based on how old someone is, their gender, you know, um, there might be a mother who doesn't want to travel so she could maybe access virtually, there might be a youth that doesn't have a safe place to call in so they need to come into the office or go into um, another type of center that's private. Uh, So having kind of those options on the table for everyone is going to be important. Increasing access to internet and safe spaces. So we we know the internet access is not uh, the same across the country that needs to be looked at and I think it is being looked at. And then safe spaces. So is there any way that we can increase the availability of of technology and privacy in our community, in rural areas, or for marginalized populations where um, these individuals can come in and access this in in a private setting, maybe community center or something like that. And then finally, maintaining the in-person services with virtual services, so having that flexibility. So I think I think that's it. You can go to the next slide. Oh yeah, this is just quickly what we're planning on doing. So we have um, released a policy brief that highlights uh, exactly what I just covered off in the implications and begins to get into some of the data. The technical report should hopefully be out in January, and then we'll have some accompanying knowledge summaries and infographics at that time as well. And uh, I believe that's it. Next, next slide. That's just our information. All right, great. Thank you, Anna and Sue. That was great. Um, oh, we can go back to the slides, Mena. Um, I, I do like how we, uh, how your presentation very nicely complemented um, Ellie's talk, talking about more Canadians in general. So I'll just encourage you to submit any. Um, I've already got. Uh, we've got some questions coming in through the Q and A, and if you've got others, please do use the Q and A tool to uh, submit them. I'll start off with a question um, for uh, Ellie. Uh, There's a question here about, do the results um, tell us anything about patient choice in virtual versus in-person care? A couple of questions related to this came through. um, Did the surveys explicitly ask the Canadians if they had the choice? 
Uh, not explicitly in the question, but the survey. Sorry, I need to plug in my speaker. <laughs> yeah, not explicitly, but I think the survey does touch on some of these points. Um, the survey does touch up patient choice specifically around the type of visit they will prefer given different visit scenarios. So we know that consumers will prefer virtual modalities for visits like prescription renewal, minor health problems, but will prefer in-person modalities for annual checkups and screening. Um, also, the survey touches on some important consumer drivers for choosing virtual versus in-person. So convenience factors, time and money savings are important. Um, things that Canadians consider when they decide whether to choose virtual versus in-person. Um, I think the point on choice is interesting because we do see a discrepancy when we look at consumer choices for choosing virtual in the future and why they chose virtual uh, for their most recent virtual visit. And um, what provider choose to offer seems to be an important driver for the most recent virtual visit. And I think more work needs to be done both on the consumer side and on the provider side to better understand how they make their choices and how virtual can con continue to play a role in healthcare. Great, Ellie. And we've got a few more questions um, relating to that and maybe I'll add a comment there as well. There was a question about, we've done um, a survey jointly with the Canadian Medical Association earlier this year. Um, and so these findings are so, uh, complementary in the sense of when we look at what the uptake of virtual care is and how often patients are being seen that way. But I think a learning um, for future research and uh, for both our patient and physician focused uh, uh, and clinician focused surveys is to find out um, if patients are being like, were you given, what choices were you given? And then what did you end up choosing on both fronts? Um, I know that there's interest in that that can help answer a lot of policy questions that are going on right now. Um, and I, I see coming through in our Q&A as well. So unfortunately, we don't have that um, level of analysis or uh, data yet, but I think um, we're well poised to kind of start collecting that information um, and look to our partners doing work in this area as well for that information. Um, I'll move on to another question for Ali. Um, and related to my last point, uh, maybe uh, what, additional work do we need to do in terms of um, investigating and uh, understanding patient reported appropriateness for virtual care? Uh, like, and this is more from an evaluation lens. What, what are the things we should be thinking about? Right, great question. Uh, thanks for that. And I think um, this answer builds well on the last point, which is what also we lack in our data collection is what the visit was for. So we did collect information on, you know, your most recent visit, who was it with, and what modality it was conducted in. But we have no insights into whether that was a simple prescription renewal, you know, getting a prescription, or was it something more complex, like a screening or a major health problem. So as we start to collect more data uh, next year, uh, when we're thinking about conducting our annual survey again, that's something we could add into our questionnaire so we can get a better understanding of not only just you know, consumer choices or provider choices around providing virtual versus in-person, but the appropriate scenarios of which uh, virtual is for versus in-person. So along with that, you know, there's a lot of research on this topic is rapidly expanding, but there's still so many questions needs to be answered. So for instance, as we touch upon appropriateness of virtual care for different care scenarios, a virtual care should be complementary to in-person care um, and not replace in-person care, of course. Um, and, but it can be definitely useful in certain instances. And we rely on experts and those with clinical expertise to lead some of this research as we expand our partnerships and expand our knowledge base. Now, our, our finding also suggests that population groups such as those with chronic illnesses Older adults tends to experience virtual care differently, which points to the need for some in-depth research focusing on how different population groups experience virtual care differently. In addition, there are some burning questions around health equity. Um, are virtual means available to everybody? 
are their population groups benefiting less or not benefiting at all from virtual expansion? Now, I think more needs, more research needs to be done to better answer these questions as well. And then finally, there are cost efficiency and cost effectiveness questions around virtual visits, right? What are some health system impacts, impacts on physician workflow? Um, can virtual visit save physician time, patient patient time, or does virtual visit cost more healthcare resources? These will be important questions to answer as well. Thank you, Ellie. Lots of um, ideas for future re uh, research. Lots of work ahead of us on in this topic. And um, I think I, I want to ask Anna and Sue as well from your work. And I think. Um, if I like this was research that kind of quickly got underway and you know the research was conducted under sort of challenging times in terms of getting responses and things like that so um, a question to you about you know what are the next steps and what, what are the areas that you want to um, do more work in or explore that's going to be really informative for uh, policy work moving forward. Um, I think it'll be helpful to possibly do a, a similar study again um, in the next few years, given that, you know, the study was kind of, kind of conceived at the beginning of the pandemic and then it was executed in the middle of the pandemic. So we actually collected our data um, February 2020, I believe. So still a lot of public health restrictions in place, but things were getting a little bit um, easier. So I think for for me i think it's going to become less about sort of like are you restricted to virtual care or do you actually start to want that virtual care is that something that you we're going to incorporate on like a more permanent basis and is that something specifically for substance use and, and concurrent disorders is that something that that group wants because when you do look at the general data around just general health care there is a lot of differences compared to the folks that are accessing this for for substance use and concurrent disorders because it is a very different um sort of group in terms of their needs so I think that making sure we don't just sort of slap one solution onto that group that's being slapped onto everyone for all of the healthcare system, making sure they have their kind of their tailored needs met as well. Um, and then we definitely want to start to dive into some more specific groups and understanding how how virtual care works for them. Um, the Indigenous communities have been brought up by a lot of partners about um, maybe doing some qualitative work with them. Uh, big, a big group that's been brought up in other surveys is, is mothers and people like living at home with, with young children. And if, uh, if virtual care is something that can, is either a good or a bad thing for them. So targeting those more specific populations would be beneficial. Great, awesome. Um, again, lots of topics for future research. And I, I think we're like, we're just starting to scratch the surface in terms of valuation and evidence in this area. And um, I look forward to when we can kind of um, share more findings and learn from others on insights that, that are being generated in this area. Um, I'm looking at the time, we've got five more minutes, and I think we've covered um, most of the questions um, that have come in. Um, and so what I'll do, maybe if you can go to the next slide, Nana. I want to thank all of you that um, joined us today during your lunch or near lunch hours, de depending on where you're joining from. Um, thank you to um, Anna and Sue. Very much appreciate you bringing um, your research to this um, network and sharing your results with us. And we're looking forward to continuing to see some of your um, evidence and research in this area back at this um, in this sort of forum. And for those of you that are um, interested in our work, we've uh, there are a few different ways for you to connect with us. There's um, Digital Health Info Watch that you can sign up for to stay up to date on the latest research in digital health. InfoWay Insights is where you can access um, the data that Ellie presented, other data that we're collecting um, sort of interactively, I encourage you to visit that. And then on Dataverse, we've got the actual raw data sets um, on a lot of um, research work that we do. We um, upload, it's there for um, use for researchers um, and our partners. Um, I encourage you to check those out and feel free to connect with us if you have questions on any of those. Um, I think we're gonna wrap up maybe five minutes earlier. Um, we will be sh uh, sharing the recording from this webinar and the slides um, shortly after the after today. 
Um, and thank you again for everyone that um, joined, for everyone that participated, and I'm really looking forward to our um, next webinar where I can connect with all of you again. Bye, everyone. Bye, thank you.